All right, I have hit the button. Let's see if YouTube will. Yes, it will grace us with its good graces. Hello, everyone. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and I'm here to bring you the story of another copyright attorney that we've been following for a long time. This is, of course, the story of Richard P. Leibowitz. This is just going to be one chapter in a very long uh, episodic about Leibowitz. I have a whole playlist that someone calculated it out. It's something like 28 hours of content of just Leib covering Leibowitz, this one attorney. This is going to be the case of Robert Berg versus m &F Western Products. Before the court is defendant's motion for attorney's fees and costs, the court previously granted defendant's motions for summary judgment, and now defendants have reasserted claims for $483,808.20 in fees and costs from plaintiff Robert Berg and his counsel, Richard Leibowitz. Now, I know we often think about Leibowitz as the primary bad actor, but just keep an open mind here and let's see what's really going on. Plaintiff Berg and defendant M and F Western both design and sell Western jewelry. Here, Berg sued M and F Western for copyright infringement, alleging that M and F Western was infringing certain of his designs for cross pendants and belt buckles. Cross pendants and belt buckles that are listed here in Exhibit A. Here we have the M and F Western on the left. I think. The Berg is in the middle. Um, and yeah, I can certainly see that they both look like a cross. But you know how we discuss the fundamentals of copyright on this channel a lot. Reminder that one of the fundamentals of copyright is that you only get protection in what you add. Your cross is not yours just just a t-shaped cross pendant would not be copyrightable that is an age-old design and a tenet of one of the major religions of the world so when i look at this the first thing i think of is well you're not gonna get copyright protection just because it's in the shape of a cross it's a little lacking in detail in the middle there, what in the world is the actual design? Is it really so close to the design on the left? And I think not. I think there's not enough copyright protection there. But that's not actually the way the court, that's, that's not what the court based its decision on. Here we have a similar situation. Just some uh, beads or, or pearl shaped silver beads or balls. Uh, five arranged in the top, bottom, left, and right centers of the of the oval. Uh, does that really merit copyright protection? I I question that. Same thing on this page. The cross pendant with the they don't look like serpents. They just look like scaled squigglies with a flower in the middle so maybe like maybe that's a rose or a flower in the middle or, or something i don't know they we leave a lot of poppies around here where i am now so i automatically see poppies every place here's another one i don't i think that's the i think the middle is the first example from the first page and i just don't see how these are so close that okay this one's at least similar i don't know about substantially similar in protected elements um, and i guess these are examples of them being shown on instagram pages or, or uh, facebook pages let's continue mnf western first sought summary judgment on the belt buckle infringement claims because the allegedly infringing get this the allegedly infringing designs predate the creation of plaintiffs copyrighted designs Predate means MNF Western, the defendant's designs came before the plaintiff's designs, so that, that ain't going to work out the way the plaintiff had hoped. The court granted partial summary judgment in July of 2020 as to the belt buckles. A month later, MNF Western moved for summary judgment on the cross-pendant infringement claims. 
that there's there's cross claims and then there's cross pendants. So you've got this attorney's mind totally screwed up. It's the cross pendant infringement claims, the direct, direct infringement claims. MNF Western argued that Berg's cross pendant designs were not copyrightable and that Berg had not produced a shred of credible evidence demonst demonstrating demonstrating that MNF Western copied Berg's designs. The court granted partial summary judgment regarding the cross pendants in December 2020 after receiving supplementary briefing. MNF Western also sought sanctions against Berg's counsel. Remember, MNF Western is the defendant, Richard Leibowitz. MNF Western argued that it had repeatedly told Mr. Leibowitz that his client's claims were without basis in fact or law because his client's buckle design was created and published seven years after the defendant, MNF Western's. And rather than removing the belt buckle claim when he filed the amended complaint, Mr. Leibowitz added entirely new facts that nonetheless do not address the fundamental failure of the claim. The court denied this motion without prejudice in January 2021 and allowed MNF Western to reassert the arguments in a motion for attorney's fees, and that is now all that remains before the court. MNF Western argues that it is entitled to reasonable costs and attorney's fees totaling $483,808.20. And that may sound like a lot, but... Well, the judge and the opposing party are going to have the chance to attack that, so let's just see what they have to say. Both from Berg as the prevailing party and from Leibowitz as a result of his litigation misconduct, Berg responds by arguing that granting fees and costs would not further the purposes of the Copyright Act and that his claims were objectively reasonable. If you remember the Akilah Hughes, Carl Benjamin case, Carl Benjamin got his attorney's fees awarded because Akilah Hughes's claims were not objectively reasonable and properly motivated. Alternatively, Berg argues that MNF Western's fee is grossly excessive and should be reduced by 50%. Leibowitz, in opposing sanctions, argues that he was justified in ignoring factual evidence provided by MNF Western and that Rule 11 should not be used as a form of compensation to defendant under a fee-shifting theory. Reminder, Rule 11 is Federal Rule of Civil Procedure Number 11. It requires that parties in general, but also the attorneys that sign the papers, have a basis in law and fact and have done some kind of minimum due diligence to verify the truth or falsity of the claims they're about to make. And of course, only true claims, only sincere claims should go forward. The court will address costs under 17 U.S.C. 505, that is the fee-shifting provision of copyright that says the court may award attorney's fees to the prevailing party, and then the court has a whole list of factors to go through. We call them the Fogarty factors because they come from the Fogarty versus Fantasy Supreme Court case. I think it's Supreme Court. The, the judge is going to cite it in a moment. We'll see. The basic point of reference when considering the award of attorney's fees is the bedrock principle known as the American Rule. So we have the American Rule and the English Rule. This is the American Rule of fee shifting. Each litigant pays their own attorney's fees, win or lose, unless there is a law or a contract that provides otherwise. Parties seeking to rebut the American Rule presumption must specify the statute, rule, or other grounds that entitle them to an award. MNF Western claims entitlement to fees as the prevailing party in a copyright action. Under 17 U.S.C. 505, the court, in its discretion, may allow the recovery of full costs by or against any party. The court may also award a reasonable attorney's fee to the prevailing party as part of the costs. Section 505 fee awards are discretionary, but they are the rule rather than the exception and should be awarded routinely. Notwithstanding the Fifth Circuit's direction to award them routinely, fee rewards are not automatic. In exercising its discretion, courts consider several non-exclusive factors. Law students, these are the Fogarty factors. Frivolousness, motivation, objective unreasonableness, and the need to either compensate or deter. The balancing of these Fogarty factors must further the purposes of the Copyright Act, encouraging and rewarding authors' creations while also enabling others to build on that work.
The parties do not dispute that MS that M and F Western is the prevailing party here. The court thus turns to the Fogarty factors. First, the court considers the frivolousness and the objective reasonableness of Berg's copyright claims. A key function of copyright law's fee-shifting provision is encouraging people to litigate strong positions, either as the plaintiff or a defendant, and discouraging people from commencing or settling nuisance suits. While all elements must be considered, this consideration may be given special weight. On the Buckle claims, m and Western's supposedly infringing design was marketed nearly a decade before Berg's creation and publication of his copyrighted designs, and Berg's only answer to this fact was unsupported speculation that m and Western's evidence could easily have been fabricated using a simple digital editing program. So I get stuff like this a lot from potential clients and consultations and things in my practice. Um, this comes up in my cases, my piracy cases. Someone will say, well, I don't know if I did it or not, but my Wi-Fi was open. We'll just tell them my Wi-Fi was open. Could have been anybody else. That's, I, and I tell my clients, that's part of a complete breakfast. I grew up in the 80s and there were all these sugary cereals that were terribly bad for children, for, for really anybody to eat. If all you had in the morning was a sugary cereal before you went to school, that was not a healthy breakfast. But these companies got around the immorality of that by having this like two seconds at the end of the advertisement or commercial on TV that said, this cereal is part of a healthy breakfast. And then they would show a picture of an actual breakfast with like vegetables and juice and, and toast and eggs. And, and so like, yeah, if you had a little bit of sugary cereal along with an otherwise healthy breakfast, that does not make the cereal healthy. You can't say, my Wi-Fi was open and provide zero other supporting evidence. Whenever I've succeeded in defending a case based on the, my Wi-Fi was open, it's, there's a lot of other evidence that we provide. So if this is where Leibowitz and his clients stopped, that it could have been easily fabricated using a simple digital editing program, that's, that's not going to be enough. And the court says so. These claims are clearly frivolous and objectively unreasonable because it is impossible for m and Western's design to be a copy of something that did not yet exist when it was created. So the judge doesn't even give that claim any weight and, con and, and continues to evaluate the case as if there was no evidence presented of the, the m and Western design being later in time as opposed to earlier in time. On the cross pendant claims, still that's that still messes my brain up. I, the cross claims, no, the cross pendant claims. Berg argued that the three M and F Western designs infringed two of Berg's designs. The court found that Berg did not provide sufficient evidence that M and F Western had access to Berg's specific designs. This is an important part of copyright infringement law. Unless there is evidence of actual copying, then you need a two-part test, which is substantial similarity. We always hear about that, but you also need to prove access along with substantial similarity. So if two artists, and this happened to the Dennis the Menace artists, there was a Dennis the Menace in America and there was a Dennis the Menace in the UK around the same time, and they were similar. I don't know if they were substantially similar, but they were created completely independently. And you can go watch Simon's video on the Today I Found Out channel, I think it is, about the two Dennis the Menace copyright creations. And I don't remember if there was a huge fight over it, but it was determined that they were independently created. So if Berg and m and Western create substantially similar designs, but, but Berg can't prove access that, that m and Western had access to Berg's designs, then automatically that's not substantial similarity. That's just two artists creating something similar independently. The judge also found that the works were not similar enough to make up for that lack of access. That's the standard of striking similarity. So if they're an, if they're an actual copy of one another or so close that they you look at it, it's like, whoa, those are the same thing. 
that's called striking similarity. It should strike you how similar that they are. More than just substantially similar, a little, you know, you know, maybe some of those designs that we saw are substantially similar if you're not considering what's a protectable element or not. Because remember, they have to be substantially similar in protectable elements. But forgetting about the protectable elements, sure, this beaded design is substantially similar to that beaded design. This uh, uh, frame is substantially similar to that frame. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm being a little bit loose with that evaluation here, but sure. But without access, you have to prove either actual copying or uh, striking similarity. Of course, actual copying would mean access because if you could prove that, you could also prove access. But uh, if you can't prove access, then striking similarity is your standard. The court's grant of summary judgment does not necessarily mean that the claim was frivolous or objectively unreasonable. There is a difference between a meritless claim and a frivolous claim. A claim is more likely to be found frivolous or objectively unreasonable when the lack of similarity between the unsuccessful plaintiff's work and the allegedly infringing work is obvious. So objectively unreasonable or frivolous when that is obvious when the lack of similarity is obvious. And the court explicitly found that the differences between the accused m &F designs and Berg's designs were obvious. For the, for the one design where the court did not describe the difference as obvious, the designs were noticeably different despite the low resolution images Berg provided. I think that's uh, these low resolution images in the middle here. Uh, it just, it doesn't have enough detail for me to be sure that these things are substantially similar or strikingly similar or not. Moreover, Berg could not provide more than a speculative and conjunction conjuncture based theory of access. So speculative and, conj and conjunct conjecture, excuse me, conjuncture, I mean conjecture. So speculation and conjecture would just be guessing, basically. Thus, the cross pendant claims were likely frivolous and or likewise, frivolous and objectively unreasonable. Berg also argued in the footnote here that m and Western never acquired the intellectual property rights for the earlier buckle. The court found that the right to the earlier buckle was transferred. So there, so yeah, if, if m and Western hadn't bought the rights to make the buckle, sure, then it couldn't argue. Uh, but the buckle's availability earlier undermines any tentative theory that the supposedly infringing designs were copied from Berg's. Second, the court considers Berg's motivation in bringing his copyright claims. Infringement claims brought to protect copyrights have proper motivation, whereas suits brought with malevolent intent do not. Specifically, litigation meant to interfere with another party's business cause the other party to incur needless legal expenses or extract a settlement is improper. Berg's motivations appear to be mixed. On one hand, Berg, while discussing this lawsuit on Facebook, admonished those thinking of copying copyrighted designs to forego thievery and respect others' works. Great, great. That is very high-minded. He further stated that it was not only for his company, but for all of the future artists in America. Okay, seems properly motivated. But, on the other hand, Berg's conduct strongly implies improper motivation. Berg identified 27 other West Western wear companies that he had lined up for litigation and was actively sending demand letters that used this case to feign leverage. So... He doesn't have this case finished yet, but he's using it to threaten other companies with litigation. Specifically, Berg was claiming that other parties should settle. Ooh, wow. Other parties should settle his claims against them because MNF Western was facing 1.5 million damage in damages, $1.5 million in damages for 10 infringing designs in this case. So he was assuming or, or using the $150,000 per willfully infringed work, the maximum statutory damages. I, I don't think that this is a maximum statutory damages case. I mean, I don't see this as maximum statutory damages. This is, this is basically, I mean, pardon the pun, but this is like a Hail Mary case. This is like a, we hope that the, 
defendant caves in and and just gives up and, and admits that they lose the lawsuit I, I just don't see it this posturing colors all of berg's actions here and strongly suggests that he was more motivated to maximize the number of infringement claims for leverage in extracting settlements both from mnf western and other western wear companies than he was motivated to protect his intellectual property and then the court compares docket entries in the case these various exhibits changing the supposedly infringed upon cross pendant mid briefing without explanation another exhibit changing the theory of copyrightability mid briefing after being notified of potential insufficiency changing the theory of access after being notified of factual impossibility so the the plaintiff through Leibowitz kept changing their story basically changing their allegations changing their theory of the case Berg's motive in this case seems improper especially when considering that his copyright claims were frivolous and objectively unreasonable so we have frivolity objective unreasonableness and improper motivation so far I think we're, we're going for are we going for are we gonna have the bingo card of Fogarty versus fantasy I need to make up Fogarty versus fantasy bingo card somebody remind me of that in the uh, in the discord Third, the court considers the need to compensate MNF Western. So this is the compensation for defending itself and to deter Berg and similar plaintiffs. Compensation helps to ensure that all litigants have equal access to the courts to vindicate their statutory rights. It also prevents copyright law from going unenforced where there is no economic incentive to defend or pursue a claim through expensive litigation. Awarding fees to a successful defendant may also deter future litigants from pursuing over-aggressive assertions of copyright claims. As noted above, MNF Western successfully defended itself against meritless claims that were aggressively pursued by Berg and his counsel in spite of undisputed evidence to the contrary. Awarding fees to MNF Western will ensure that future litigants in the company's position seek to defend their rights. It will also force Berg, who has claimed to have more than two dozen similar lawsuits ready to go, and future litigants to think carefully about their merits of their claims before filing another suit. Accordingly, a particular need for deterrence and compensation exists here. So wait, did he just skip from okay so compensation and deterrence were, were included in the in the one paragraph here after considering the Fogarty factors the court finds that MNF Western is entitled to full costs including reasonable attorneys fees as the prevailing party under 17 USC 505 having concluded that MNF Western is entitled to reasonable attorneys fees the court turns to the amount of the attorneys fees this amount involves a well-established process the court calculates a lodestar fee by multiplying the reasonable number of hours expended by reasonable hourly rates for the particular lawyers in case this sounds weird to you there is actually something in the professional conduct rules for attorneys the rules of professional conduct that a lawyer shall not charge an unreasonable fee so there's some kind of cap on an attorney's fee you know what if you if you hire an attorney to do one hour's worth of work and they charge you five thousand dollars that's probably an unreasonable fee and you can probably challenge that and i wish i had known that when i hired uh, attorney don russo to represent me in a case against a former employer and this was the don russo that then later was suspended by the pennsylvania bar for taking those fees and not doing the work not pursuing the cases i should have been more aggressive but i was green in the past year and didn't want to make waves until i knew what i was doing so i probably lost mid five digits in compensation and uh and and, and also paid out attorney's fees then the court considers whether the lodestar figure should be adjusted upward or downward depending on the circumstances of the case the lodestar figure should only be modified in exceptional cases in calculating the lodestar value the reasonable number of hours is determined by subtracting duplicative excessive or inadequately documented hours from the records provided by the prevailing party so this is important when you hire an attorney if you hope to get your fees back in a copyright case you got to make sure 
I mean, it's that attorney's job, but the the attorney and their client need to make sure that they're documenting the hours they spend and are doing so with details, not necessarily attorney client confidential details, but, you know, had a conversation with client regarding settlement is a safe way to say it, not had a client regarding settlement, we're going to propose these terms and hope that they, you know, come back with this number. No, you don't have to do that. But you do have to say what you did for those hours with enough detail to cross this threshold. The reasonable hourly rates are determined by looking at what is reasonable in the community rather than what, be re what may be reasonable nationwide. So they use local numbers. 157 pages of documentation supports MNF Western's position of a proposed Lodestar value of $483,808.20 based on 1,035 hours worked at billing rates ranging from $145 per hour for a staff member to $885 an hour for a partner with one associate billing 510 hours at $385 per hour. Berg responds with two conclusory sentences. In the event the court grants a fee award, the court should reduce defendant's fee application across the board by at least 50% on the grounds that defense counsel intentionally racked up unnecessary fees through its refusal to extend the filing of lengthy pretrial submissions while its second dispositive motion remain pending. The overall hours billed are hyperinflated. Okay, those sound like conclusions, but they need to be supported by some sort of evidence of some kind. Berg does not argue that any of the attorney's billing rates are unreasonable, nor does he identify any duplicative, excessive, or inadequately documented hours from the records provided by MNF Western. Berg elsewhere suggests that once MNF Western filed its dispositive motions, it should have stopped working on the case altogether because it knew it would be dispositive of the case. It probably didn't know for sure that it was dispositive. What that what that sentence is saying is that the defendant, MNF Western, when their lawyers filed the motions for summary judgment, they should have just stopped because they somehow would have had foreknowledge or prescience that the judge would definitely grant those summary judgment motions and there would be nothing else to do in the case. No, you can't do that. You can't just stop. You have to you have to be prepared all the way up to the moment. I've had times where I have prepared and prepared and prepared, showed up to court, and the opposing party just isn't there. Sometimes the court grants a continuance. You've done all this work and the court just says, ah, go home, do it next time. And what do you do? Sometimes you do that and the defendant or the opposing party gets there and says, well, you know what, let's not have the trial, let's settle. And that happens. You've done all this work and you can't say that you could have just not done the work because what if you got there and the opposing party doesn't say, oh, let's settle. But as the court's scheduling order makes clear, a party is not excused from the requirements of the scheduling order by virtue of the fact that dispositive motions are pending. And even that argument addresses only a portion of the fees. Without more, the court is left guessing about what is objectionable in MNF's Western, or MNF Western's billing records. Defendant, on the other hand, has provided a breakdown of all hours billed between September 2019 and February 2021, has provided two declarations. That's under penalty of perjury. That's like a declaration under oath in federal law. They're the same thing. Two declarations attesting to the accuracy of those records from its lead counsel and a declaration attesting to the reasonableness of the billing rates from Perkins Coy's Director of Pricing and Practice Management Economics. The court has reviewed these records and declarations and finds the hours billed and the billing rates reasonable. Further, the court has compared the billing rates to a normalized median rate calculated using adjusted for inflation median rates provided by the State Bar of Texas. This comparison further confirms the reasonableness of the rates provided by MNF Western. Accordingly, the court accepts MNF Western's proposed Lodestar value of $483,000. The Lodestar value is presumptively reasonable, but may be adjusted for the circumstances of the case. Courts look to 12 Johnson factors in considering whether the adjustment is necessary. Adjustments are proper only for exceptional cases. Neither party has argued that this is an exceptional case. In any event, the court has independently reviewed the Johnson factors and declines to adjust the Lodestar value. So how about we just skip the 
Johnson factors. Having determined that MNF Western is entitled to fees and costs, the proposed lodestar value is reasonable. No adjustment is warranted. The court grants the $484,000 approximately in attorney's fees. Now we're going to get to Leibowitz. MNF Western also seeks a sanction against Richard Leibowitz, Berg's counsel, under the Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 11 or the court's inherent powers. Rule 11 provides that an attorney presenting to the court a pleading, written motion, or other paper that that attorney certifies to the best of the person's knowledge, information, and belief that it is not being presented for an improper purpose, that the claims are warranted, and the factual contentions have evidentiary support or will have evidentiary support. The Supreme Court has explained that this rule imposes a duty on attorneys to certify that they have conducted a reasonable inquiry and have determined that any papers filed with the court are well-grounded in fact legally tenable and not imposed for any improper purpose accordingly a counsel accordingly counsel must make a reasonable inquiry into the factual basis of any pleading motion or paper must make a reasonable inquiry into the law and not sign a pleading motion or other paper intended to delay proceedings harass a party or increase the cost of litigation there is a presumption that pleadings are in that the pleadings are filed in good faith and the party seeking sanctions has the burden to prove otherwise, under Rule 11c, a court may impose an appropriate sanction. MNF Western argues that Leibowitz's approach in reasserting the buckle claims with no investigation and no basis violates Rule 11. That's consistent with his behavior in other cases geared towards leveraging a settlement and is therefore sanctionable. Leibowitz knew MNF Western's buckles predated Berg's designs, and yet he signed his name to pleadings, motions, and other papers claiming that the buckles illegally copied Berg. As MNF Western has conclusively demonstrated, its counsel sent Leibowitz authenticated photos of a catalog with the allegedly infringing buckles dated 1995, seven years before Berg created his designs. Leibowitz's only justification for pursuing these claims in the face of such fatal evidence was his unsupported speculation that the catalog could easily have been fabricated. Again, you have to provide some kind of backup to that. Find the catalog that's labeled 2005 instead and show how it was fabricated. Basically, you have to do your investigation, your due diligence. You hire a private investigator, hire an expert witness. I understand that these are barriers to entry. These costs act as barriers to entry or access to justice problems. And realizing that this was a losing argument, Leibowitz alternatively claimed that MNF Western did not own the earlier buckles, ignoring the asset purchase agreement that was plainly that, that plainly transferred the relevant intellectual property rights. Further, this is not a first offense for Leibowitz, who has been described by another court as a clear and present danger to the fair and efficient administration of justice. That's Mondragon versus Nosrak. See also Rock v. Enfant Richet de Prime. And we recently recorded the Second Circuit Court of Appeals affirmation of the Jesse Furman order, which was a treatise or catalog of all of the Leibowitz shenaniganry up to that point in justification of an order forcing Leibowitz to notify all of his clients and courts of his misconduct. Leibowitz's failure to investigate the evidentiary basis for a complaint misleading the court and making meritless arguments is also cited here. Accordingly, the court finds that Leibowitz violated Rule 11 by filing pleadings, motions, and papers, reasserting and maintaining the buckle claims, knowing that the claims were meritless. Having found that Leibowitz violated Rule 11, the court must impose an appropriate sanction. Such a sanction may, but need not, include payment of the other party's expenses. And here's where I start to get my, my fingers all a Twitter here. Maybe they're going to visit $484,000 worth of sanctions on Leibowitz. When selecting an appropriate sanction, the courts have a duty to impose the least severe sanction that is sufficient to deter future conduct. 
the court has already awarded MNF Western its attorney's fees and costs. This cures the injury stemming from Leibowitz's misconduct. It may also deter future misconduct because clients will be less willing to retain Leibowitz if his unwillingness to vet and reject frivolous claims causes such an expense. The imposition of sanctions pursuant to Rule 11 is meant to deter attorneys from violating the rule. Further, the Eastern District of Texas recently suspended Leibowitz from practicing law in this district based on his suspension from the practice of law before the Southern District of New York. The dominoes are starting to fall. Starting with, I mean, I believe he was suspended from the Northern District of California, where he was never admitted, but I believe he was disbarred from it anyway. And then recently, the Southern District of New York, which is his home district, they suspended him from the practice of law. That's New York City. That's a big deal. And then other courts where he is admitted pro hoc vice or admitted to practice permanently, they have started suspending him as well. Now the Eastern District of Texas has fallen for Leibowitz. Taking into account Leibowitz's misconduct, the fee award, and the indefinite sus suspension, the court finds that a non-monetary sanction is sufficient here to deter future misconduct. What? Wait a second. That's it? That That's all the court's going to do is, 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 is just confirm Leibowitz has been suspended and... Okay, well, the plaintiff got hit with the attorney's fees for the defendant. Leibowitz you're reprimanded. Accordingly, the court hereby publicly reprimands Richard Leibowitz for his misconduct in this case and admonishes him that should his ability to practice be restored, future breaches of Rule 11 duties will result in the imposition of more severe sanctions. That is... That is insufficient, in my opinion. So the court hereby grants MNF Western's motion, orders Robert Berg to pay MNF Western's attorney's fees and costs in the amount of $484,000, reprimands Richard Leibowitz for breaching his duties under FRCP 11, and admonishes Leibowitz that future breaches of such duties will result in imposition of more severe sanctions. Ordered and signed yesterday, the 28th of June, 2021, Jeremy Kernodal, United States District Judge. Now, the judge has the discretion to do this, and I think I can understand why the judge would do this. It did seem like maybe Robert Berg's motivations weren't entirely clean either, so maybe the judge is kicking the can down the road, the can of the fee shifting and who's going to pay for that. Instead of, arg in, instead of ordering Leibowitz to pay it, and then the judge has to deal with Leibowitz's inevitable appeal, that argument should be had between Berg and Leibowitz. And if Berg wants to make a malpractice claim or some other appropriate claim because of that attorney's fee award, that's between him and Leibowitz. So follow me on this. If the judge here made the order, and we all wanted the judge to make the order, if the judge here made the order, then the judge is going to be the one hearing any opposition to that order, any appeal of that order. But if the judge just gives the attorney's fees to the defendant from the plaintiff and not from Leibowitz, well, Leibowitz is still on the hook for having represented the plaintiff, and whether Leibowitz had a proper representation agreement, whether Leibowitz made the plaintiff, Robert Berg, aware and fully informed that losing a copyright case like this could result in a fee-shifting arrangement, that's going to be between Berg and Leibowitz, and then Judge Kernodal doesn't have to deal with that. So... Berg could sue Leibowitz in whatever court has jurisdiction. I don't know where Berg lives or where there's personal and subject matter jurisdiction. But if Berg and Leibowitz can't work out who pays this attorney's fees award, then yeah, it's going to be between them to litigate it on their own. And I think Judge Kernodal is just saying, I don't want to deal with you guys. Get out of here. So he's giving the sort of a minimum order that will get it out of his court, 
shift the burden to the plaintiff and the and, and the attorney to work it out, Berg and Leibowitz, and the defendant MNF Western should still be getting their fees at some point, or they'll I guess they'll have a judgment that they can visit upon the plaintiff. So yeah, ultimately the plaintiff is is responsible for it, and then the plaintiff can go after Leibowitz if there's some kind of claim there. So yeah, that's maybe a little bit um bittersweet it's not quite what we had hoped for let's see just dean thanks for the two australian dollars did berg approach other lawyers i don't know if we have i have a second here maybe i can quickly look up this case we'll grab yeah i didn't want to highlight that We'll grab this case number and I'll throw it into my legal research system real quick here. Uh, I don't think there's another um, attorney listed here. It's Leibowitz Law Firm and Perkins Coy. I don't see a new law firm here. Uh, but this is just what my legal research system says. But I do see Leibowitz re replying all the way up to March 12th. And then they waited for the judge's order. And then the judge has entered that as a judgment as well. The, ju the, judge the judgment should be for the $483,808, which means that the plaintiff can, the, the defendant can bring that as a uh, judgment to the county level and get that attached to any property yep the four hundred eighty three thousand let me see if i can open this up for you here open when done no not her open with system viewer is what i meant there we go so here's the final judgment, which includes the $483,808.20. So yeah, that's uh, not what we would have hoped for against a serial copyright litigator like Leibowitz, who has had 40 or 40 plus issues with misconduct between before various courts has been suspended from the Southern District of New York and now the Eastern District of Texas. And I think... The North Carolina court did something similar. I think we saw that in the Aaron Carl case. So yeah, let me know what you think of that in the comments below. It's a little bit disappointing. Um, we recently, I did, I recently did a story about how Rudy Giuliani was suspended from the practice of law, pending his final determination of his misconduct because he did something similar with Rule Eleven and frivolous litigation. So you would expect that Leibowitz would have been uh, disabled by a suspension or disbarment a long time ago. But he's a slippery attorney for I don't want to I don't I don't want to say uncouth words anyway. Uh, that's what I've got for you today. Thank you for joining me. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and hopefully you enjoyed today's show. Special thanks in the month of June to our $50 plus supporters on patreon.com slash ljfrench and sponsors.com slash law and YouTube membership and float plane subs. Special thanks to Joe Tyson, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Spirit Bear, Benjamin Hightoff, Ugly Grill, Rudolph Bescher Jr., Torpedon, Brandon Abel, Shadow Tycho, Earthbound Star, RDH Dragon, and Pure Magma. And thank you to our $5 plus supporters who are in the description on the tablet behind me. I love you all. I'll see you in the videos. Thank you for watching.